thank you for the introduction. So uh, I just want to mention that this work, um, I actually work with Jane Buggo and Marie O'Neill on, on a publication that actually um, has been published in UKSG Insights. So if you're interested in today's talk, please read our article. So um, next slide. So I just want to first start with the presentation to see how many of you actually recognize this person. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> okay, that's very good. So her name is Kathleen Carrico. Her early research into mRNA uh, eventually led to the development of the COVID-19 vaccine as many of us have benefited from. So, um, but a lot of you don't know her, and why don't you know about her? She joined the University of Pennsylvania in 1989 and submitted her work in uh, about mRNA to Science and Nature, the most prestigious journals in the sciences. Both re rejected her papers. When her work was finally published, it received little attention and few citations. She was not successful in grant applications either. Eventually, she was demoted by UPenn and then moved to industry. At the time of the reporting, she never re uh, earned more than $65,000 a year. This one, I'm not going to test you. <laughs> All right. She's Mary Abuskas uh, on yoga. I, I, I probably actually has pronounced her name incorrectly, but that's okay. Uh, she is an expert in African indigenous crops when she submitted her work to Scopus and Web of Science Index, clarifies out there, and journals, they were rejected. In her own words, it was, quote, not because the research was not good, but because they regarded the crops I was writing about as weeds, end quotes. She finally published her work in an African journal which influenced the Kenyan government in the development of nutrition schemes and eventually, many Eastern African governments have also adopted the schemes. In other words, her research has significant impact in addressing poverty, malnutrition, and food security. So I wanted to begin my short talk with these two examples to illustrate the, that we are actually missing a lot of good research in our scholarly records for reasons other than quality. So how can we ensure important research are supported and not merely driven by research metrics, university rankings, and national priorities, how can we support bibliodiversity, especially when considering global knowledge production? So what is bibliodiversity? The definition is that it is a complex, self-sustaining system of storytelling, writing, publishing, and the other kinds of production of oral and written literature. The writers and producers are comparable to the inhabitants of an equal system. Bibliodiversity contributes to a thriving cultural life and a healthy equal social system. Um, <laughs> however, it can be argued that the current research equal system is perpetuating a monoculture because the majority of publications is published by authors affiliated with North American and Western European countries. At the same time, basic research in the sciences in STEM and scholarly works in the arts and humanities and some social sciences are increasingly sidelined, driven out in the, the so-called developed country. So if you don't believe me, I work with my students, an MLIS student, uh, last year for his thesis to look at the publication trends in the directory of open access journals by country's income level. Uh, this particular study has been published in Learned Publishing, if you're interested. Um, so in this study, what we found is that just over 1%, 1% of articles in the entire directory of open access journals were published by authors affiliated in um, low income countries. And most open access publications are published in gold open access journal. Uh, that, that means, for those of you who don't know, journals that charge article processing charges. Now, there are a lot of problems and issues involved in, in this particular picture. And today, I just want to give you a sense of the academic publishing industry. 
Here you can see the big nine in article processing charges revenues in 2020. So the first came up is Springer Nature, and second, MDPI, and some of the familiar names that you are actually seeing. So uh, when I saw that last night's dinner was sponsored by MDPI, I was a little bit reluctant, and I didn't show up. Um, <laughs> um, um, so uh, in the past few years, article processing charges have been increasing at a higher rate than inflation for some of these publishers. For those of you who don't know, the article processing charges to publish in Nature, where Catalina wanted to actually publish, is currently 9,750 euros per article. In terms of market share, um, so again, some of the publishers you saw out there, <laughs> it's dominated what is called the big deals. This is uh, coming from the big deals report by the European University Association. And you can see that they occupy over 50% of the market share in terms of publications in Europe. And the expenses uh, were, was over 75% of the total cost. So the smaller publishers actually charge less. Uh, so the infamous one, Elsevier, so I, I think everyone knows about it, so I don't, <laughs> it's okay for me to say about it, reports profit margins higher than companies such as Apple and Google, but a bit lower than Pfizer. All right. Now, um, that's not the end of the story. It's not just about publishing. So you see what is called a vertical integration in um, academic publishing. So the German funding agency, the FG, has published a report that details data collection practices. So they are actually using these products as well, collecting data uh, when researchers are doing their research, including when someone is searching for a topic, including how much time they spend on a particular article, including um, uh, what they highlight. So you say that, you know, what's the problem with it? There are a lot of problems, but this is particularly true when um, Elsevier's parent company actually sells this data to government agencies. So it has been reported that they actually sell data to immigration uh, the, the uh, agency in the US for deportation purposes. So um, I think I have to go very quickly here because I'm running out of time. Um, so um, open access at the crossroads, that's actually the, the title of the paper that we, uh, opinion piece uh, actually uh, we published. We were, we're really actually thinking about, you know, looking at the context of the academic publishing industry in the sense that transformative agreements do not really resolve budgetary issues because in the sense that we are actually uh, looking for more money to pay for article processing charges instead of subscription or whatever that is, is, is very complicated when I talk about money. Um, so, and that access to scholarly literature is largely contingent on the availability of um, a commercial, totally commercial research infrastructure. And then the gold open access model entails that authors without funding cannot make their work openly accessible. So, um, what can we do to support bibliodiversity and a sustainable research ecosystem? Um, currently, many are pushing for what is called a diamond open access model. I'm not going to give a lecture about what it is. I assume that most of you know. Um, meaning that scholarly works are openly accessible with no subscription fees or article processing charges. Um, this has been actually, there's an there's a open statement from the European Council just two days ago to support this particular move, but how the implementation will look like, we still don't know yet. Now, um, getting to library publishing. So the Library Publishing Coalition, so this is one of the things that we actually suggest that can help with uh, promoting and really actually moving academic publishing <coughs> towards Diamond Open Access. So, um, Library Publishing Coalition defines library publishing as a set of activities led by college and university libraries to support the creation, dissemination, and curation of scholarly and creative works, etc. So the very, very basic idea is to actually take back control. Um, so that's, I suppose, is the end of my presentation.